Okay, cool. All right, everybody. Well, welcome. Welcome to our disasters uh, class. So um, this is only the one, two, three, only the fourth time we've ever taught this class. So this is uh, and, and the first time was vert. The whole thing was virtual it was it was coming out of the pandemic. Um, and then the second time we we had the Omicron wave and all that kind of stuff got really weird. And so it was kind of a sort of hybrid thing. Um, uh, happily, we are uh, back to face-to-face uh, -face classes. And so with the exception of this week, we'll be having face-to-face. -face. And in super exciting news, I can tell you, I, I've been here for 20 years. I've been, I'm an old, old guy. Um, and I've been trying to get university vehicles for 20 years. And without going into the specifics, it's been a huge, insane challenge. Last uh, spring, we were able to have a, um, a leased van to try, to try it out and it worked really, really well. And so uh, uh, I happily over the break was finally able to acquire a van. So we actually have a departmental van as of now. And so um, while this class is a three unit class and it's not, um, it's not primarily a field class, most of our ESRM classes have a, have a strong field component. While this is more of a lecture based um, course, uh, we will do hopefully at least one or two field trips uh, this semester in support of this class. Um, and uh, I'm super stoked to say that uh, if, you know, when we do such field trips in, in our department, of course, people live in different places and you can you can come and, and uh, you know, drive there. Uh, but uh, know that you will have an option for folks that don't want to uh, drive. Uh, um, you can jump in the van and we can uh, go around. So. So that's the first time I can actually officially say that, that it's not a temporary measure that, um, so I'm very, very stoked. Uh, so even though this isn't a field class, we're gonna use the van. So uh, uh, welcome to disasters. Um, as I said before, uh, I, I just got back a few hours ago from um, several weeks in uh, Maui, where we were working on, among other things, disaster recovery. And, and so unfortunately our, our apartment just was not very good with uh, the internet and we were running around all day long in the daytime. Um, so I've not finished setting up our Canvas site. I will have that set up at least the first week or two of modules will be set up and turned on as of later today. So right now you can't see anything on, on Canvas. I understand that. I apologize, but just want to make sure you guys know um, that uh, it will be turned on. And so I will poke everybody again once uh, with email once that is done. Um, and we'll go over some logistics today as well. Um, but yeah, and in general, uh, today, this week, since we're we're um, virtualized, but also during my regular lectures, all that kind of stuff, you guys can always interrupt me. Please do interrupt me. Um, not a problem. Uh, if I'm saying something that is, I'm either speaking unclearly or too fast or what have you, um, or something just didn't quite make sense. Absolutely. Hey, Dr. A, can you, uh, what was that? Could you go over that again? Um, by all means, please do that. Um, especially right now, since I'm um, screen sharing my um, my lecture here, I can't see easily see your hands um, uh, wave. So please, uh, if I say something in the next uh, you know many minutes here, please just uh, unmute and just uh, and just verbally interrupt me. That's cool. Can everybody see our welcome to disaster slide up here? Just out of curiosity. No. Yeah. No. I don't see it. Maybe not. No. Thank you. Okay. I don't see it either. Let's try this. Well, I'm super glad I asked. How about that? There we go. See it now. Okay, everybody. Welcome to disasters. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, uh, yeah. So, so let's let's start off uh, again. This stuff will all be uh, on our Canvas page when it's up. But you know, it is our it is our first day, so I want to make sure you guys know this. So um, we will be in person for the vast majority of this uh, semester. Our classes are Monday and Wednesday, starting at nine. Um, note that uh, normally I I hold these classes either in our Cons Bio Lab or our Tech Lab on the second floor of Sierra Hall. We were assigned a different room number. 
Um, and so, and so next week we will start in that room, but if, but we, we possibly might shift to our second floor ESRM spaces if they're not occupied. So I'm a little bit unclear why, why, um, why we weren't in there, but, um, but regardless, we're going to stay with the room that's in the calendar to start or in the uh, schedule of classes to start with, but we might, we might shift that room, but regardless, the times are solid. Um, Again, the, the Canvas page isn't up, but I'll just say in general, when we have stuff for the week, um, assignments, lab activities, things to work on. Uh, the general default th thing is that for, for week two, stuff is due on Friday of week two, and, and, um, and uh, five o'clock is our default uh, time. Um, again, I mentioned that we will hopefully be doing at least one or two field trips here. Um, uh, I don't have anything um, scheduled yet. Regardless, they will not be in the first few weeks. So the first few weeks, we don't have to worry about a field trip um, going on. Um, our final time is uh, May 13th. Um, uh, we'll talk about that later, but uh, uh, this is going to be when something is due. We don't, we, we won't necessarily show up for a, an actual in-person test, but but that is when your final assignment will be due uh, at at our final time. Um, if you guys haven't had me before, my name is uh, Dr. Sean Anderson. I have an about me page in our canvas that you can read about, but um, uh, short, short version for me uh, just now because canvas isn't on. Um, uh, I, my background is I did my PhD in marine biology, but I've done a lot of stuff um, beyond marine biology. So now I mostly work in the broader coastal zone. So I work on land near the ocean and on the ocean near the land, generally speaking doing a lot of things related to conservation and increasingly I do I've been doing a lot of policy in the last uh, decade or so or, or, or helping trying to inform policy and that type of stuff. Um, uh, my office hours are um, are I think this is correct I, I might have to update my office hours I can't remember but um, but I'll double check. Uh, regardless, I always have two options for you uh, any given week I have a face to face um option uh at which in this case is right after class um obviously not today not face to face uh, but but after this week face to face and then on the other day a zoom option so whatever you feel more comfortable with if you have work or or something like that you're more than welcome to do the zoom uh version if you are doing face to face um, uh, you know, I'll meet you up at tortillas up, uh, just out in the patio at tortillas, unless it's raining, in which case would be indoors in tortillas. Um, whatever format works best for you, it's all good. Um, I do ask that, uh, if you get, I mean, anybody can, you guys can come anytime to my office hours. So just, just pop on over. Ideally, it'd be best to use my Calendly link, um, which is, a uh, how you guys can, um, uh, book times with me. And the only reason for that is just to make sure I have time for you. So if you if you come, it's probably not a problem. I don't have I don't have people, you know, start of the office hours to the end of the office hours never able to get in. But especially when we get to like project times or, or middle of the semester when stuff kind of do um, sometimes there tends to be crunch periods. So if you um, use my Calendly to schedule a, a 10 or 15 minute uh, chunk of our time, I can be sure that that you're good, that you're good to go. Um, that that uh, there there is um, a slot for you. Otherwise, uh, again, still come, but you just uh, you know kind of you're queuing in line type of thing. Um, we'll talk about a couple tools today to get us on boarded. One of those tools though is Slack, and so I've I've sent everyone, or you all should have gotten earlier this morning, an invite to our Slack channel for this class. Um, and that's just a great way for quick questions, like wondering things, or I'm not sure about X or Y. And so you can just post to our general thread there and I can answer it. But also if any of you know the answer, and oftentimes you guys know the answer, you know, hey, did Dr. A say that was a, a one page thing or a page and a half thing or something like that, right? Um, that's a great thing to just toss in Slack and, and feel free to, to use that um, uh, to, to answer others and have conversations. Um, so. I've been using that for the last couple of years and students seem um, to like that. Um, my email, there's my email, sean.anderson at csuci.edu. I unfortunately get hundreds and hundreds of emails a day because I do too many things. Um, and an email is more or less, 
doesn't really work with me just because I get I, I would have to spend eight to 10 hours a day just doing email and rarely do I have that amount of time to do email. So please do send me an email if you have a question. Um, I usually either get back to you really quick with, with an answer or it gets sort of lost in the stack. So the best thing is to send me an email um, if it's a longer conversation thing you want to discuss. And if, if I don't get back to you immediately, please do me a favor and send me a text. So that's my cell phone. Um, and you guys are welcome to, you know, don't call me at midnight, but you guys can call me or text me, uh, you know, as needed. But the best thing is if, if it's a longer term discussion um, and I'm not responding on that email, um, go ahead and, and send me a text and, hey, Dr. A, this is this is whoever. Um, I sent you an email on Tuesday at nine. Could you please, I, I need, I was wondering if we could, we could, you know, talk about that. And then I can actually go hunt down and search for your email. And, and that that's the best way that, that works for me to make sure I get you guys. Um, uh, and then when we do our field trips and stuff, again, that's my cell phone for, for communicating with me out and about. Um, more on the full syllabus once it's up. So that we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, any general questions right now? Hopefully everybody's in this class. <laughs> um, let's talk about, uh, uh, so, so we're just gonna do a little bit of j brief intro today to sort of set the stage for disasters. Just gonna, you know, start off briefly talking about disasters today. Just a few sort of wet in our whistle, um, and then uh, ha just talk about some of the the tools that we will use uh, for this class that I want to make sure everybody's sort of onboarded with. Um, so when we say disasters, sometimes people say natural disasters. This class is titled environmental disasters, but basically when we say disasters, we're talking about something that is the result of a a hazard that's overwhelming um, to a community. It's most often understood as um, mortality and morbidity. So, so killing or hurting, harming people. Um, the frequency with which disasters are happening and the intensity with which disasters are, are occurring um, are, are going up tremendously in our world. So right now, we have about um, three, more than 300, what we historically have called natural disasters uh, yearly around the world. And um, though each of the, every year we have millions and millions of humans directly affected by these disaster events. And the cost is easily into the tens of billions. And increasingly we're talking more like hundreds of billions and, and more. So, so these things are costly in terms of money. These things are costly in terms of human lives. These things are costly in terms of our society, costly in terms of biodiversity, all that kind of stuff. So, so that's what we're going to be talking about um, this semester. Um, uh, disasters going on all the time. So here's an example from uh, uh, the last time uh, I taught this class. And this was um, just before our class started. This is a uh, uh, middle of the Pacific and a big giant um, uh, volcano going off uh, and throwing a huge plume of ash uh, straight up uh, deep into the uh, upper atmosphere. Um, these disasters are going on all the time. So that was a volcano from um, a couple years ago. Here's a volcano right now in Iceland. So this start, this most recent eruption started uh, in the first week of December, but it's still going on. And right now, uh, this a very popular tourist town, uh, which is near a place called the Blue Lagoon, which is sort of a famous uh, 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 vacation spot uh, in Iceland. Um, this is about 70 kilometers from Reykjavik, uh, the capital. Um, uh, this just uh, last week, they were ordered to again evacuate because this lava is starting to flow and starting to now move through the um, streets of the of the the town. And so, disasters always going on, always going on, always going on, and. Um, and so these are, in one sense, one sense that's kind of good because I mean it's not not some brand new thing we have to deal with. However, um, the nature fueled by climate change, fueled by human transformation of our natural world, and all these things, the intensity and the and the problematic nature and the scale of these uh, things that have always occurred are getting um, uh, more and more rapid, are getting more and more problematic. So. When we say uh, when we say disasters, most of the thinking on this has been based around what people refer to as natural hazards. A hazard is something that could be a problem. So a hazard is a threat 
than a natural, naturally occurring event, lightning strike, fire, uh, flooding, that kind of stuff, that that, that event could negatively hurt us. Um, when it does, when, when so maybe a problem, hazard. Once it happens, disaster. Um, and so when a hazard uh, manifests itself, uh, we historically have referred to that as a natural disaster. But the thinking about this is almost all based on um, uh, uh, historic thinking about nature versus humans. And um, the idea here is this is oftentimes in a, uh, oftentimes these types of courses are offered in a geology program or an earth systems program, uh, which is uh, often heavily um, conceptualized around things like earthquakes, physical uh, 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 threats, physical hazards. So earthquakes, uh, landslides, um, uh, volcanoes, things of this nature. And so a lot of the thinking about the, the traditional discipline of how we, how we teach and, and, and plan for natural hazards um, has grown out of very much sort of a volcanologist, uh, you know, earthquake expert um, perception of the world. And that's really an earth systems approach and very much a um, sort of uh, physical sciences type of approach to thinking about these things. And so um, essentially natural, not, not to be flippant, but, but sort of natural hazards were sort of people that love volcanoes kind of needed to justify them, justify themselves, right? So they started getting into this kind of, well, I love to study volcanoes. So let's study how maybe we can make volcanoes not as problematic. Or I'm really interested in earthquakes. I find the phenomenon fascinating, but um, I can't just get money to study them. So I, I should get money to see if we can predict when earthquakes would happen, you know, that, that type of thing. And so all good, all, all, you know, useful stuff, but um, that has really dominated most of our um, conceptualization of the natural hazards. And what we'll find out with, through this class and we'll explore it in this class is that that's great, that's useful, but really we need a much more diverse conceptualization, a much broader thinking of what disasters are, what disasters do, and how we should be preparing and and organizing ourselves before one of these events happen to try to minimize that. And so this is inherently interdisciplinary. So inherently, lots of different folks, lots of different perspectives, lots of different ideas need to be brought in if we want to um, appropriately deal with our, our existing world of natural hazards. That sound good so far? Any questions so far? Okay, cool. All right, so I'll just ask real quick um, before we go on. Um, have you directly, has anybody here directly experienced a disaster, directly been affected by, um, uh, say, a natural disaster in the last uh, few years? Go ahead, un unmute and, and chime on in. Like a forest fire count? Sure, sure. why not? Okay, then that. <laughs> So, so where, so, so tell me what, when, when was it and what happened? Uh, a few years ago, I lived on a big ranch property kind of north of Goleta and there's mm -hmm. a big fire that broke out and that got really close to my house at the time. Um, so I had to evacuate and everything couldn't go home for a few weeks. Um, but yeah, everything was fine. My house was okay, but it was like very jarring waking up at like 3 AM to leave the house. Totally. These things can be incredibly scary, incredibly scary. Um, uh, it, it, it's sort of a joke, well, joke, it's not a joke. It's sort of a, um, frequently commented thing. Uh, so, uh, I work uh, one of my long-term projects is in new Orleans where the major disaster there most typically are hurricanes. And so, um, it seems like a lot of times we Californians go there and people, we, and, and the default thinking is, man, God, how could you guys live here with all these hurricanes? Um, because you, it comes on the news. Now we have such fantastic ability to predict these things and track things with satellites, et cetera, that you, you can see the storm track. It's like, okay, in four days, there might be a, a hurricane coming and then three days away. Well, it's really pretty likely to hit your area, right? 
So we see that and kind of think that's stressful. Our friends in Louisiana look to us in California and go, God, how could you live in California? Because you guys have earthquakes. Well, although now, now we seem to be mostly known for wildfires, but, but historically it was known for earthquakes. And, and they'd say, how can you handle that? Because all of a sudden it just happens in the middle of the night and you have no prep. And so, so it's what we get used to. But regardless of, of where we live and, and the, the risk environment where we live, whenever these events happen, they are always a surprise. Um, they're always scary. Um, and they, they always are, are, are challenging things to go through. So great. Awesome. Thanks. Anybody else? Anybody else experience uh, a disaster? Nobody, 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 nobody. Um, uh, I have been, um, I've experienced many disasters. Uh, we just had um, the, the anniversary of the Northridge earthquake in 1994. Um, I just literally just started, I, I um, started the academic year late. I was in Antarctica doing some diving underneath the ice. And so instead of starting, in the fall, I, I came back basically Christmas time. And so I was, I just had gone to UCLA for my very first visit and had, you know, was getting like an ID card and that kind of stuff. And then that next weekend, um, uh, that earthquake happened. And that was, that was of all the disasters I've experienced, that was probably the most scary. I could not, we were living in an apart, a three-story apartment building. I could not, believe that that whole building did, did not cr collapse around us it, it was shaking so much it was it was crazy so I, I can tell you more earthquake stories but but that and then ex i've experienced many wildfires uh, in the last couple years campus all of campus burned up um in 2013 not not the buildings but all the surrounding areas around campus with, with the uh, springs fire um uh, again yeah we'll talk about all these things but but i've experienced um uh, many disasters and they're always scary um okay so 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 uh more about that uh when we get to it um let's just start off briefly conceptualizing disasters before we um uh as by way of of introduction today um and so let's talk about uh some examples of these things so um one of our first skills though before we do that something we'll be working on this semester is note taking so you guys, this, this shouldn't be a huge surprise. So you guys all take notes for all your classes and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but I've noticed that in some t some cases, especially post pandemic, not everybody's been as as um, rigorous as or as robust as maybe they should be. And great note taking is a really really useful skill. Um, so uh, just want to talk about note taking, and um, uh, give you guys an opportunity to practice that on the next sort of chunk of the of the lecture here. But um, why don't you guys tell me, tell, tell me some examples of how you guys take notes before I even start to, to talk about stuff. You guys tell me, how do you, how do you prefer, what, what's your favorite way to take notes on a lecture or a class or a reading or something? Cameron, how about you, Cameron? What, 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 how do you, what, what's, your, what's your preference? Uh, for lecture sort of notes, I don't because I spend most time writing down the I don't hear as much. So lecture wise, I just try and pay more attention than actual writing. Okay. If it's more like reading, highlighting key concepts cool. and that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So I think I think the fact that I record my lectures hopefully is helpful for you guys if you, when you need to go back and review or 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 do that kind of stuff. Um, active note taking makes a huge difference. So listening is cool and 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 that that's you know central. That's key. Um, but as much as you can sort of annotate, adjust, that's really really key. Sophia, how how do you prefer to do uh, take notes? I mean, pretty similar to what the slide says, I'll usually jot, like write down key terms or like phrases, ideas. And then as like the lecture goes on, I'll like write notes underneath expanding upon them. Okay, cool. Um, how about one more? How about Autumn? How, how do you, what's, what's your, what's your preferred way to, to 
take notes. Um, I definitely like having, um, I use an erasable pen, so it, it helps cool. make everything um, coherent. And I like highlighting the terms that I need to remember um, when cool. the, especially when the teacher's like, you should have this memorized for like the test or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Awesome. So, so great. So, so this is an opportunity for you guys to just keep doing what you're doing, maybe kick it up a notch, maybe, maybe, um, you know, do whatever, uh, whatever is your jam, but maybe we can, but I, not maybe, I want you to specifically put some time this semester into, into, you know, taking your note taking up another level. Um, so, uh, I used to take, uh, all, so I, I, took a lot of notes when I was um, in your shoes. And um, I would write very, very fast. And, and I would be sloppily, right? Sloppily write stuff. And it was like, Arr. and um, so what I figured out for me is that I needed to copy over my notes. Like, so, you know, in the class, you know, jot, 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 jot. And then after class, I needed to, to go back and, and, and look at that over. Because if I just left it in my notebook, um, and came back, you know, a week or a couple of weeks or before the test or whatever it was later, it was hard to decipher. And so, um, uh, uh, one technique that you guys can do is, is to actually copy over your notes. And that's actually really, really useful. And the act of copying it over, um, making it more organized, making it more neat, drawing parallels, organizing it yourself. So I'm going to give you information that is hopefully fairly organized. Um, but just because I think it makes sense to me, maybe it makes a, a, a better sense to you in a slightly different form, right? That's all good. You don't, I'm looking for you to deeply understand these ideas, deeply understand these concepts. Um, and uh, so maybe that's the order I say things in. Maybe it makes more sense to sort of move some things around, right? And that's all up to you. And that's really easy to do when you're recopying over your notes. Um, I think the thing that's most important is you don't want to just sort of copy down whatever the heck I say and then never look at it again or never engage with it. Um, so that that sort of um, copying over or reorganizing um, really helps to bring out the key themes and, and helps you to be able to tie into the reading, to the this, to the that, to, to all these uh, different areas. Um, so, so active note-taking, active recopying over. Um, I, I had a roommate who um, it was, it was very annoying. Very annoying. I had, a, I had a DJ business with him for a while. Um, uh, uh, super good friend of mine, but super annoying when it came to note-taking. He's one of those crazy annoying people that had a perfect memory, a photo recall in terms of what what he would see and so he would never come to class i would go to class all the time take massive notes and uh and you know like spend hours and hours copying over my notes and like the diagram of a cell or whatever it is that i was doing i'd color it with different colored pencils and all that kind of stuff and then uh and like study 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 and i go take a test and i get like you know an a minus on the test or something he would come in the, like the night before the test just smoking cigarettes, he'd have cigarettes, and he'd sit there, smoke cigarettes, and he'd just read all my notes, like one time, and he would get like an A plus on the test, and it was super annoying, so, uh, so if you guys have a photo memory, congratulations, but most of us that don't have a photographic memory, we need to sort of do all these, these, these tricks and these approaches, and, and the fact of review is really, really key, and I, I see a lot of you guys not not doing as much review, maybe right before the test, but that's that's not the best way. The best way is like all the time review, sort of check in, go back and forth, and copying over is a great opportunity to force yourself to do that. Okay, um, so there's various methods, and and if you guys haven't, and you all have your method, if you haven't tried one of these other ones, I'd say you know give it a go, maybe maybe take a whack at the next a few minutes when I when I get back to the the topics we're going to talk about. Um, and so so one one idea is is sort of a what's known as a mind map. And so rather than sort of say, you know, first thing, and then bullet point second thing, and then bullet point third thing, fourth thing, etc, in a sort of top of the page to the bottom of the page approach, um, rather, uh, sort of a 
a conceptual map, right? Or, uh, and so how does this thing relate to that? And so, so each of the topics or each of the themes or, or whatever is in one area, and then you can draw a connection to um, other ones. And so a lot of people find this to be a really helpful way, especially when you're trying to review and understand the relationships between different things. So that's called a mind map. Um, there's also the classic one is the um, a lot of people use this. It's known as the Cornell method because it used to be um, strongly um, suggested uh, at, uh, at Cornell. But essentially, uh, in, the, in the classic approach, they take a piece of paper and they divide it into different chunks. Um, and so on the, on the right side of that piece of paper is the, is, is the you know, stuff that I, I say to you and you, you're jotting down the phrase and all that kind of stuff. It's like the raw stuff, right? Um, the thing on the left, those cues, those are like the big ideas. Um, uh, uh, Matt, so in the case of disasters, we'll talk a lot about um, the, the intensity of them, like how, like, like the scale of them, how, how big the, the actual event is. And then some of the key markers of the impact of a, of a particular disaster, um, the key response elements. And so, so we might be just be talking, you know, running through talking about um, the disaster and you're taking the raw notes on the right, but then you might pop over to the cues and sort of say, ah, this is the impact phase, or this is the um, other thing. So those cues really help make sense of the notes. And then, and then when we're done with that section or that day's uh, you know, topic or whatever it is, then on the bottom, there's a summary. So the bottom is a, a brief uh, pulling together of all that kind of stuff in, um, again, doesn't have to be sentences, but is, is a, a, a short encapsulation of all that stuff. And that uh, seems to be really um, helpful. And so in general, the note part, the white part, you would do um, as as I'm talking and you know, as the slides are coming up and that kind of stuff. Um, the cues you'd be doing like when we're pausing or we're reflecting or, or um, right after class. And the summary would also be done once we are done with the, uh, you know, the idea there. So you're not doing all three of those at the same time. You're sort of doing one and then red and then blue or white and then red and then blue. So that's called the Cornell method. Um, the key thing is that, uh, that whatever the thing that you've done, I want to ask you to be to kick it up a notch this semester. So let's let's make it a bit more rigorous, right? Let's make it a bit more of a, of a default process. And so um, the key thing is you really need to go back and look at your notes. So I, I really, really would encourage you all to copy over your notes when we're when we're done. But regardless, at a minimum, you should be going over, pulling off out those notes. And that goes for that matter for our readings and all the other stuff with class. So we have, you know, here you guys do this reading, 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 and you, and you go through it. Once you're done with that module, you should pause or go have dinner, whatever, and then later um, or the next day, whatever, come back. And what what was Dr. A trying to, why did he give us these readings? Like what, what were the big themes that sort of were running through all of these all of these readings this week or or um or what was the most surprising thing about all the you know that kind of thing and so so you know go back and review 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 um now i get it you guys have a lot of classes i get you have a lot of stuff um i you don't necessarily have time every single day to go review all of our notes from all the class all the time but if again you build this into a clear um a clear schedule that would give you an opportunity to, you know, review the, the last lecture, last day of lecture stuff, and and maybe mm, the week before and that kind of stuff, and a little bit every time will help you, um, will help you uh, get better and better, better dramatically help your retention. And again, um, the more you can reorganize and put whatever that form is in your own language, that's the best. Um, so. So here's some examples of some stuff. So here's on the left is something we'll be talking about uh, this week, which is some of the World Health Organization's classification of hazards. And this is just an example of when I was first reading these, kind of what I was doing. So first, so this is, this is basically a PDF thing, right? So that, that's a PDF. And you, some of you guys mentioned highlighting. And so I've gone in and I've used my little PDF highlighter tool. Um, actually, let me ask you guys. So when you guys read 
our PDFs, um, you know, electronic document in Canvas or or whatever. How do you how do you mark up the the PDF? How do how do you um, take notes on that PDF? You guys tell me. Vanessa, how, how do you, how do you how do you typically do it for a, for a typical class? Um, for me, my note taking is kind of like I mainly just do paper with pen or pencil. I don't really use like electronic, but I'll just look at like. So, okay, so, um, so do you you print up the you print up the PDF and then read it as a in a printed form? Yeah. Uh huh. And then like okay. I noticed that just works for me better, just like totally. writing it down physically. Um, it helps me remember totally. more. But I'll star things, write little notes next to it highlight underline you know and use different colors that really helps too absolutely so so um highlighting is really useful um but highlighting is generally um dangerous very very dangerous so it's it's super easy to highlight and only highlight so in this case i've done just what just what we're talking about so i've i've made like a, a green highlighter and i high lit highlighted whatever the right terms highlighted um the you know the, the terms let's say in green here right so that's cool and then i and then the other things i wanted to to highlight but i wanted to um note that it was sort of a different group and so there i changed my highlighter color made it yellow and sort of you know hit those things but then what and so you know i say highlighting is dangerous and it's it's you got to be really really careful with it um it is a useful tool the problem is when you only highlight. So the other key thing we just heard there was I star stuff, I comment on stuff, I I adjust stuff. And that all the research shows that's really where you learn a lot more. When you just highlight, it doesn't activate the same areas in our brain. When we actively annotate, that's when um, we activate areas of our brain that we have more uh, active memory in. And and the even even though even though your 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 hand is mechanically moving on the page and you're mechanically highlighting, it's not the same level as you actually writing a word or a symbol. And so here, I sort of said like you know in this case like what this doesn't seem I don't this I don't think this is relevant to us or does this matter and so you know maybe this is wrong or why did he say that those kinds of comments. Um, in other cases, it might be. Oh my gosh! This is uh, the same thing we read about last week, or 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 this is or this is the same idea of, from last week, but it's a different example. That type of stuff is really really key. And so, do not just highlight. If you want to highlight, that's okay, but make sure you're also highlighting and annotating. Um, an example on the right is uh, is just some you know, random stuff that when I was getting ready for a lecture before I was working on some stuff. And so um, while I historically have always used physical, uh, you know, paper and stuff, this is a tool that I've um, really started to use a lot. I started to use it during the pandemic and I just, I just use it um, frequently. So it's, it's basically an iPad or, or in any, any tablet. Um, but the particular one, and I've tried, I, there's a gazillion million options out there, but this is one that I, um, personally like. Um, and so this is uh, just an it's, it's an online, uh, it, it's basically electronic paper, right. And so I have different tools, I have highlighters, I have, I have all kinds of stuff. And I can write on here. And I can I can cut copy paste, I could grab an image, throw it in here, etc. And so what you're looking at on the right is essentially um, a, a screenshot of of one of my um, things, the one I use is called notability, but there's there's all kinds of wonderful tools out there that make it really easy. Um, in this case, I can do this on a blank piece of paper and just make notes like like you guys were lecturing to me and I just made notes, or I can suck in a PDF and augment that PDF and, and sort of annotate that. So, so regardless, um, I'd like regardless of what your tools have been in the past, I would encourage you to try at least one new technique, or one new new app or something um, to uh, uh, deal with uh, reading and engaging material electronically this this semester. So okay, so that's a little bit about note taking. Makes sense, you guys. So so um, key thing here is be an active note taker. Recopy over notes, review notes. That's a that that'll make a huge difference in your retention. You'll do way better in the class, and it'll just be better uh, 
overall. Is it, does anybody have any other thing we, we haven't touched on? Any, any other suggestions that works really well for them in terms of note taking and synthesis that I didn't, that I didn't touch on? Or they think other people might want to try, find useful. Through the semester, no. I'll make yeah. like pretend tests to review myself of what like we've been learning the last few weeks to kind of force myself to study while making like the quiz, but also right. like reviewing once I'm taking the quiz to kind of reiterate what I've been learning. I love it. I love it. Um, one thing. I, I, I get this is a three unit class. We're just, it's, 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 a, it's a lecture class. It's not as intense as some of our other classes. Um, but uh, I also encourage you, so that's a great idea. Is, is, I, I, I think that's, that, that's a really um, uh, excellent way to prep. Um, another great one is to study with friends, same kind of idea. And so um, just invite everybody here to, I mean, I know we're virtual right now, but, but you can either use Slack or next week when we start physically um, being together, um, uh, see if people are interested in grabbing lunch or or dinner once a week or something like that. And and study groups uh, really really um, can make a huge difference. And so um, so great opportunity for you to review your notes, review other people's notes. So do do think about that. Um, it, it might really um, be a, and it's also it also is fun. You get to hang out with people and and talk about the the ideas of the day. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let, let's have your first practice here in terms of uh, some note taking, and let's see what you guys do. So, so again, recall that the the big idea from the disasters we were just talking about is that uh, a disaster is when a, a hazard actually manifests itself. So, a hazard happens; it influences us, it influences our neighborhood, it influences our community, whatever it is, or something we care about. Um, to the point that it's bad, that becomes a disaster. So if we just have a fire that's over the next hillside over, yeah, that's kind of a problem, not a big deal. But once it impacts us or impacts our community, that's when we use the term disaster. Um, now, we'll talk about the disaster bureaucracy in this class, the, the modern disaster bureaucracy in our country. Um, but I'll just say for now, it is very complex. There are agencies, there are organizations, there are structures that have grown up to deal with this aspect that we encounter routinely. And it can be very daunting. And so um, rather than start off talking about disaster, the, the bureaucracy that's built up around disasters, I want to start off just talking about um, a, a disaster uh, that we just were dealing with uh, as of up until yesterday. Um, uh, in terms of ESRM. And so that was the most recent Maui wildfires. So we will be talking in depth about how wildfires occur, the drivers, all that kind of stuff. But this is more just a, an example to give you guys a taste for the kind of, of things that we need to be conceptualizing when we talk about disasters. And so um, this was uh, the um, one of the most famous towns in Hawaii, Lahaina. So Lahaina is on the, the island of Maui, and this is the epicenter of, of contact with the Hawaiian Islands and the outside world for several hundred, of, several hundred years. This is where sandalwood, which is one of these um, uh, uh, classic uh, mature forest uh, woody species that was very desirous, it gets traded um, uh, with the East, especially a lot of traders from China. Uh, and through that conversation right here, just off the coast here, there's a huge concentration of humpback whales, one of the greatest concentrations in the world. And so that trading gets out, or, or, or the traders that are trading sandalwood end up talking about that. The whaling community has depleted whales all around the world at this point. They hear about this area with lots of whales, and that brings them to Lahaina here in Maui. And that's the first consistent contact um, intense contact with folks outside of the immediate Hawaiian Islands. Um, and so it's based right here in Lahaina and it grows up as a port town. It grows up to supply timber to the whaling uh, operations and, and vessels and uh, everything you'd imagine comes with that sales houses, um, uh, brothels, bars, all kinds of stuff. So this was, this has been 
um, a tourist place, if you will, uh, a, 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 a trade place for hundreds of years. Um, this area that we're, I'm showing you right now is called Front Street. This was the main drag. And then just to the right is the harbor where all the boats would, would have been um, anchored. And so this is in the immediate wake of the fire. Again, we'll talk about the, the details of what led up to the fire, et cetera. But this is what um, it looked like. And, and as is often the case with the disaster, there's how the disaster is perceived by the community experiencing, experiencing it and how it's perceived by the people outside. And they will always be different. It's, it's virtually impossible for those things to be the same, but we should, we should really understand that. In this case, this was a series of fire storms all around. So if you haven't been to Hawaii, um, this is the island of Maui in the center here. Uh, so the, 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 the main, what we call the main Hawaiian islands in the lower right that we think of. The Hawaiian archipelago actually stretches out for thousands of miles, but we'll leave that aside. These are, these are the, the populated places. And so this is Maui. Right here, right where it says Lahaina, this is where um, we have been based for the last uh, few weeks doing our work. Um, but if you have a look, all of the, and this, this is a, a map from uh, mid-August, um, or actually early August of 2023, what you see here is all kinds of fire spotting. So we have, it, the, the Lahaina was obviously impacted by a wildfire. Uh, Kula, uh, don't worry about the names, the other town up here, other area, what's called upcountry, over here, over here, here, all of these fires are going on, right? Um, but what we all hear about in the news is, of, of course, the historic town that, that so many people know, a very famous town, but all kinds of areas are being impacted. This is what, now, this area is... Um, uh, huge for tourism, right? So this is this is a, a major, major um, uh, area for tourism. The fire happens immediately. Hey, stop, everybody go away. We have to deal with this wildfire. The hotels have burned up. People's homes have burned up. We can't deal with tourism. So initially it's visitors stay away. After about two months, um, these folks are unemployed basically, right? A lot of these folks, maybe you sell hot dogs, maybe you work in a hotel or whatever it is. And, and so... Uh, the message goes out, actually come back. Actually, you know, tourists, you please do for the facilities that are destroyed, please come back, be here. And so, however, it's it's unusual in that the the impact is is hidden from most people. So this is so let's go on a little drive here through the area. So right now Okay, so right now I'm on, let's, let's go like this. So right now I'm on a road right here, driving like this, and I'm gonna drive in through the, the old town. So we're approaching uh, the core of Lahaina. This is where, so the fire came from the hillsides up to the right of us and came down into the heart of historic Lahaina, the heart of the historic uh, uh, residences of Hawaiian royalty, the heart of the original uh, tourism trade and international trade, um, uh, where whalers put in, where sandalwood was exported, all that stuff, and unfortunately went right down the gullet of this historic town. So right now, as we turn left, we'll see that much of the infrastructure is still destroyed. This is January 2024. So we have an emergency cell tower there for communication. Um, and a little bit of optimistic rainbow there off to the side as we get through this little rain cloud. So as we pull in, you can see um, the, the huge swath of damage right here through the core of the Hyatt Town. So there's a little bit of building going on here. These are areas that were already prepped um, right here to the right that you see some, some new building going in, but most of the area is untouched. So, most, so that area was had already been cleared before the fire. They're getting ready to put in some housing, and so that's why it wasn't burned. The immediate area right in front of us, the fire didn't hit. So everything is all, so this immediate little core of buildings was the only area that was not burned, but everywhere all around it is burned. To the areas we go in, you're going to see um, our cordons and so the public is not allowed into uh, Lahaina right now. 
Uh, but you have to have a residency permit and you can only go briefly in. Um, we're just getting ready for debris removal, um, which has been a problematic thing. And so this immediate core right here, as we come, these shops were spared. And so with all disasters, we have this, this bit of an irony of, of some uh, areas avoiding the impacts, other areas being hit. So, so ironically, this little um, shopping uh, complex right here, as we turn right, uh, survived. So these stores are here, which is, you know, good for the community. There's, there's some places to buy food, et cetera. But the residences, the, the historic um, waterfront, uh, the harbor where our whale research boat usually goes out of, all of that is destroyed. And so what's gone in now are these uh, barriers uh, to the right and left. Um, uh, one, so that people don't go in, and two, so that uh, it, there's a bit of a, a shielding from the, the public. So as we, we're continuing this way, we're continuing north here towards the, the, the tip of the, the west tip of the island. Um, we are going through, so this is Lahaina proper. And as we continue to go, uh, there's uh, Kanapali and, and these other uh, resort areas just north of us, which were basically unimpacted. And so a lot of the tourists now, this tourist centric economy, everybody is uh, or the economy is built around you know people coming in for vacation and so so this area has been screened um one to to give people some well for a bunch of reasons um but but first and foremost to sort of prevent gawkers from gawking and stopping on the side of the road and taking photos and all that kind of stuff um there's very little interpretation okay so right there um sorry let's see right there so that um the next thing i stopped there's there's a big bunch of um uh, school kid art interpreting like people that passed away so over 100 people died it's the deadliest modern fire in u.s history the the, the lahaina wildfire was um and it's it's very raw um, so that doesn't, this is what I just showed you, doesn't really look super crazy. It, 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 the town is gone, but that immediate core, because as you come down, there's this, um, as, as you saw, like the core shopping, like the Safeway, the food land, that kind of stuff is, is, um, is intact. It's very, e and because we've had, we have these, um, uh, big screens, it's very easy for a tourist to come in, to go to one of the resort areas, just, just say north of here and just drive through and not see anything and go have your margaritas on the beach and have your Mai Tais and, and all that cool stuff and not understand what's going on. Another dimension of disasters that we'll explore is it usually doesn't start something going bad. It usually intensifies or makes worse existing fault lines in our society or existing problems that we already have. And so that's absolutely the case in this with, with the Lahaina fire so uh before uh, uh this this time last year let's say just like california just like ventura county just like a lot of the places where we live um housing is a problem it's super expensive so if we were if you and i were working um in lahaina let's say in maui we wanted to get a, an apartment just you know the two of us for a two-person apartment you know small place with a bathroom and a, and a bedroom and, and, and a parking you know that kind of stuff you're talking about two thousand five hundred a month for for that that one little apartment that was before the fire after the fire that same apartment is now seven thousand dollars a month um there's there are over a thousand families still today that cannot find a place to to reside not a thousand people a thousand families and so one of the consequences is is this one of the most conspicuous post-disaster impacts uh, that we tend to see in the wake of something like a wildfire um, comes due to the denuded uh, hillsides landscapes that typically follow um, an intense fire and that is the removal of vegetation, removal of soil stabilization. So when we do get um, the first good rains or you get into the rainy season, we tend to get a lot of erosion, a lot of runoff. Um, here, 
in the Lahaina area, kind of district or Maui. Um, we can see that right right now in January of uh, 2024. So here, this particular area is a public beach, and um, this is an area where folks that have lost their homes are here um, because there's nowhere else for them to go. And this is a public. Uh, the beaches in Hawaii are public, but nevertheless, um, uh, they're not protected from the ravages of the wildfire. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at this beach where um, uh, normally if this is a quote unquote normal year, we have you know, tons of tourists out here and, and, and folks fishing and all that kind of good stuff. And now um, it is, uh, we just had a, a second big rain uh, since we've been here and you can see a very clear demarcation of uh, the, the inshore area. We've had a lot of soil um, mobilized. So we can see pretty clearly a lot of chocolatey um, tan water that should look, you know, blue or greenish color. Um, and so that's what these folks unfortunately have to contend with that have lost their homes. Um, regardless of the particular situation, erosion is always going to happen in the wake of wildfire um, every single time. It's just a question of how intense it is. So usually we race to stabilize the soil, stabilize watersheds, things of that nature. Um, and it's usually a race between when that wildfire event happens and the, those first rains. Hopefully those first rains are gentle and relatively mellow and only, uh, you know, give a little bit of water, a little bit of water, a little bit of water. Um, but if you have a, a huge downpour, a huge torrential dump, um, very quickly or, or the, in, in the first of the season, that's when we get a lot of soil, et cetera, mobilized. Um, these folks here have the added uh, problem of, of having, because of the circumstances, having relocated to a place that, um, you know, doesn't have the best water quality and, um, and so they're also having the problems of this general flooding, not so much erosion, but general flooding in terms of where, uh, 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 you know, just trying, trying to live on, make their daily uh, lives and everything. So erosion, clear component um, and clear part of the post-fire event and hopefully um, a key part of the recovery as we try to manage these Okay, so apparently I put the wrong one in. That was that was what I was talking mostly about erosion. But but what you saw there was folks that could not. So while we have public access to the coastline written into our California state constitution since the seventies, um, Hawaii traditionally has always had public access to the coast. And so when folks found themselves unable to find a place to live, many folks have set up tents on the coast on the beach itself and um and use that as a refuge including right in front of super ultra high-end expensive uh, hotels um, and they basically say this is our ancestral right to be on the beach can't find a place to live i'm gonna live here on the beach and so um while you know an immediate disaster that's cool um, we should not be having people forced to live in tents um in these areas these uh you know uh homeless encampments type thing and so so that's another dimension to this the first the thing that happened this saturday was the first real coming together of the community these things are very real these things are very raw in terms of not being able to find work um uh having lost your your house and all of your possessions and and maybe your family members and all that kind of stuff it's been very hard for the community to come together and the, actually the first time was this saturday there was what's known as the unity march the shirt that i'm wearing this nonprofit called Lele Aloha, um, which was organized by the guy in the center here with a with a baseball hat on, um, Archie. Um, he uh, pulled this together. Now Archie, and so one one thing we can use is we can, in the wake of these disasters, we can use this as an opportunity to maybe re envision how we want to do stuff or or or, or change how we're doing things, right? Um, so rather than just coming back the way things were pre disturbance, maybe we can put new infrastructure, different infrastructure, different different priorities, and instead come back stronger. And so in this case, they're trying to use their traditional culture to heal and also um, 
uh, 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 recover spiritually as well as as conceptualize how to go forward. And so this is so these guys are um, uh, we're going to run out of time here, but these guys are um, part of the ocean voyaging community. The thing known as the Hawaiian Renaissance started in 1976 with the Hukulea, the 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 first ocean going canoe is what the Hawaiians, the Polynesians used to colonize the Pacific. The first one built in 600 years was built in 1976. And that's become a huge rallying cry and a huge opportunity for Hawaiian identity to reassert itself. And so the guy, the, these guys in the middle here were all part of that. And, and the guy in the middle, middle, Archie was the one that organized this event. So we organized the community recovery, the response to wildfire around the idea of voyaging canoes. So this is the, only the second time in history that four voyaging canoes Hawaiian canoes have come together. So this was a historic event. So these normally these canoes are all around the world and they're doing stuff. They they all stop what they're doing in late summer and turned around and came back so they could be here for this day. So this historic day, and um and and these guys are chanting. So we'll just play a minute or so of this. So these guys are basically. Um, uh, the, the canoes have just come into the beach, the community, the town that's been burned has come down to the water to greet them and they're and they're chanting um, and and they're doing the traditional Hawaiian greeting very ritualized and so there's been an exchange of of presence and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's okay. I don't, I don't know why this thing isn't running, but. Uh... <laughs> So, uh, so I'll put the whole video, but so, so really, really cool. So, so one of the strengths that we can turn to in the wake of a disaster is to use our culture, to use our religion, to use our, our traditional practices, to use our, our, our community to come together. And that's what was being done here. So, so before we start the environmental healing and the, the, um, infrastructure healing, let's get ourselves healed. And that was, that was a, a really, really cool thing to be a part of, um, that ends or to me, to me the, 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 the formal welcoming ends and we enter a series of speeches and there's a bunch of honoring of, of older folks and people that have been doing stuff around the community, et cetera. Um, uh, skipping forward a, a bunch, um, one of the folks that is honored is this gentleman right here who's an elder who's been associated with uh, the, the canoeing community and other things for some time. So we finish up uh, an, a, a, a part of the celebration and he takes the mic. And he starts to describe the Lahaina that exists now. And so the term Lahaina actually comes, even though it's a Hawaiian word, it actually comes from the colonial period. And it basically means hot or, or uh, like desert area, right? And he said, that's not what the old term for Lahaina is. And so Lahaina was always a place of royalty before it became a big epicenter of, of tourism and all that kind of stuff and whaling and everything. He said the original Hawaiian word wasn't hot desert. The original hired Hawaiian word for the area was flying breadfruit. So breadfruit is one of the key foods that um, uh, Hawaiians ate that sustained them. And this area was covered with all these breadfruit trees. It was a very productive area that grew a lot of food. When the, when the um, foreign powers came in, that was all eliminated. And so he was doing this discussion to the community and just sort of remind them of the way things, not the way they were five years ago or 10 years ago or 100 years ago, but the way they were 300 years ago or so. And he was making the argument that maybe this is a better path forward. Maybe we can, if not recreate the past, maybe we can take some lessons from what the landscape was before the natural disaster. 
Okay, so he's sitting there and he's speaking in these times of disasters. I'm not, I'm not Pollyannish about this. These are very, very hard things to come back from. And so this man is speaking and um, there is a, a young boy who's been standing up in front of the stage holding up a bamboo pole with a Hawaiian flag on it. And it was there for half an hour, 45 minutes. I thought he was part of the ceremony. I thought somebody told him to go stand up. All throughout the march, it was about a, it was a several mile march. Um, the, the march was lined with Hawaiian flags and the flags of folks from other nationalities that had perished in the fire. And so I thought, oh, the little boys up there just sort of, you know, showing the flag. Turns out um, he was told to go up there by his mother. And so as this, uh, you know, elder man of the community is speaking, uh, this lady walks up, uh, the lady over here on the left. Um, and I thought, oh, I guess the ceremony is going on. It's it's Hawaii. So we we're supposed to finish it like two. And at this point, it was like 2.30 or something. And we still had lots of other speeches. So I thought, oh, she was going to gently go up and ask, ask, uh, you know, this, this guy, hey, okay, great. You know, maybe you can sit down now. And then she starts shouting and she starts screaming into the microphone. And, and so this, I didn't take a picture of that, but, but so with the picture on the left is security has come up and they're trying to move her off the stage. And so she was saying that this time of unity, that we should not be having unity now. So she was yelling at the crowd and she said, this is not the time for song. This is not the time for hula. This is the time for war. This is the time to, to get angry and we should be growing food not homes and and just very much um, a confrontational attitude. And it represented how easy it is for us to be pulled apart in the wake of a disaster. Um, and and you know, these are very stressful times. They're incredibly hard. They're very hard to navigate effectively. And so that's also part of disasters is, 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 is being able to not just be in community, not just use your community, but to use science, to use all the tools at our disposal to not be torn apart because they're it's so easy to get torn apart and then the recovery doesn't really happen very well and and then if anything we're more vulnerable to future disasters okay so i was going to talk a little bit about, about terminology too late i, I talked on, I, went, I rambled on too long here so so we'll pick this up on wednesday but um in general uh, that's what I wanted to sort of highlight for you guys. And we'll start talking about this stuff as we go on. We'll, we'll talk about the, the lead up to the drivers of, of disasters. We will talk about examples of disasters and we'll get into some categories of disasters fairly intensively, wildfires, hurricanes, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of similarity, even though the, the, the actual thing, fire, wind, water might shift, a lot of the, the impacts are, are fairly consistent and how we can approach our responding to those to try to avoid them before they happen, to try to recover from them after they've occurred um, are actually pretty similar and we've, we've learned some things. And so, so that's the kind of stuff we're gonna be talking about um, uh, this semester in our disasters class. And so with that, um, I wanted, we're just about out of time, but I'll just note for you guys, there's um, uh, two uh, other, so we, we've mentioned Slack. So please jump on our Slack. Let me, let me kill this, uh, this screen share. Um, so, um, so you guys should have all gotten an invitation to Slack. So you can join that, uh, join our Slack channel. Uh, and then there's two other tools that we'll be using. One is called Scoop It. Some of you have used it in my previous classes. You should have also gotten an invitation email earlier this morning to our, to our Scoop It. Go ahead and sign up for that. We'll go over it. Um, you know, once I have the module up, you, you guys will be able to see how to use that. But essentially, we're going to use that for you all to share stories about natural hazards and natural disasters um, uh, as we go throughout the semester. And then the third one is a tool called Plotly. So we will be doing graphing in here. You are welcome to use whatever professional graphing tool that you like. Some of you guys like to use Python. Some of you guys like to use R, Tableau. Any of those are totally legit. Don't want you to use Excel. So don't use Excel. I want you to use something really robust and professional. Excel is a wonderful tool for organizing data. It's pretty crappy in terms of making professional figures. So um, if you don't have any of those other tools at hand or you haven't experienced that, we have a tool called Plotly. And so I'll go over that as well. But Plotly 
is a free browser-based uh, tool to make simple graphs, not super, super sophisticated graphs, but simple sort of X, Y plots, which will uh, be useful as we go through um, the semester and also just help you get better with your graphing and, and data presentation type of stuff. So um, while Plotly, you have to sign up for yourself, the other two, Slack and Scoopit, you should have received an email invitation. Um, so check your check your email. If it's not there, check your check your spam. Um, if not there, uh, look for to the links when I when I activate our Canvas site, and you'll be able to um, to get on with those. So so please do go ahead and, and and get on those. Even though I don't have a particular task for you at this moment, but go ahead and get those things activated. When you do that, your Canvas, your Slack, all these things, please put a good um, photo of yourself, a good headshot in there. Um, and make sure that that your name is is correct and everything. Um, sometimes I get students where they have like their nickname or something like that, and, it, and it's just like a black box and a nickname. Picture and all that will really help me. Um, and with that, I think we're just about out of time. So uh, I'll end it there and ask if you guys uh, have any questions.